Well, Americans better pay attention to what's happening in Ireland right now. The beautiful country of Ireland has suddenly found itself at the center of a debate over immigration, the erosion of civil liberties, uh, free speech, all of it in one big mess right now. After a man stabbed five people outside of a school, including three children. It turns out the man was an immigrant who 23 years ago received a deportation order by the Irish government. He later won an appeal to become an Irish citizen. Uh, turns out he also hasn't worked a day in his life. Then the city of Dublin erupted in violence following this stabbing. Rioters burned businesses, looted buildings, and the head of the Irish government, the chief of police, blamed the violence on anti-immigrant extreme right-wing extremists. That's how it usually works. But is there something bigger going on here? For that, we wanted to bring in David Thunder. David is a researcher, lecturer in political philosophy, and uh, he has been covering what's been happening in Dublin extensively. David, welcome back to the show. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks very much for having me. Were you surprised that the political class in Ireland immediately blamed the violence, the rioting, the looting on right wing extremists? It sounds like a, a message right out of a sort of a Biden playbook. It's it's MAGA extremists who set fire and looted these buildings, distracting maybe from the real issue. Were you surprised by their response? No, I wasn't. I wasn't surprised by their response because um, in general, the narrative that they have been developing over the last, well, for as long as I can remember, is that um, there is a certain class of persons in Ireland, namely anyone who has any uh, question or concern over immigration, who are the extreme right. Um, so that's the context. Uh, they, they have been dismissing uh, voices about immigration um, as extreme right. And these are people who have a legitimate concern because Ireland is absolutely, uh, its health services um, are saturated, its, its housing is saturated, and many Irish people cannot access affordable housing and have not been able to do so for years. And it's against that backdrop that the government has, has implemented an open door immigration policy where they essentially allow in um, enormous uh, number of immigrants and refugees or asylum seekers who are then given accommodation uh, either very cheaply or for free, while Irish people are not, not able to access accommodation themselves. I think uh, it's important that listeners understand that that is the backdrop. That's one of the important details that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, another important uh, detail is that there have been several high profile um, some gruesome murders, um, including a decapitation over the past uh, couple of years that were carried out by, uh, let's say, people of non-national origin, people from other countries who had been naturalized as Irish citizens. And so um, when this gruesome attack on children outside of school was carried out by a man of Algerian descent, I mean, that is a recipe for a lot of public anger. Um, so I think public anger is justifiable, but the, uh, the looting and setting fire of on police, police vehicles on fire and the trams and the bus and this sort of thing is absolutely, uh, is absolutely just loutish criminal behavior that's completely inexcusable. Um, but the idea that these louts going around town looting and setting fire to public property where where the product of the the, the far right um these people probably have no idea don't follow politics have very little idea of right. what it's about um and yes there was a very kind of uh, let's say uh you know very tense atmosphere in town and a lot of people were very angry and surely that contributed to the violence um but uh, the, the last piece that I wanted to put on the table that's important is that Dublin is a thriving crime scene. And basically in Dublin, there is a, a lot of criminality, a lot of uh, petty crime, a lot of public disorder of various sorts, um, drug dealing and so on. And this has grown over the years. So these people who suddenly started setting trains on fire did not come out of nowhere. These were people who had been roaming the streets because of poor policing and because of a broken criminal justice system. Hmm. 
Right. And if you point out Ireland has an immigration problem, you might be arrested for hate speech. The government is trying to silence Irish citizens and they're using the looting, the bad behavior, the, 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 the burning of the city as a reason to silence Irish citizens. I always, you and I were kind of texting about this a few days ago. Whenever we have one of these events, I always wait for the governments to swoop in to try to take away civil liberties, to take to to clamp down on free speech, we're seeing in the United States right now, uh, and so this is what's happening in Ireland. This move towards uh, this is hate speech. Um, Conor McGregor is finding out exactly uh, what that's all about. Can you talk a little bit about Conor McGregor's response to this on social media, and then of course the response around hate speech? You can't speak out against immigration. You can't speak out about what's hap actually happening in the country. We're going to silence you. Yeah, well, I mean, Conor McGregor, he's a kind of a boxing hero in Ireland. And so um, he just said we need to really, he said we need to come down hard on criminality. And we have to acknowledge, you know, my recollection is that we have to acknowledge that there is a problem with immigration in the country. Um, and we also need to come down hard on crime. We need to control the streets. Um, and Wow, that sounds really inflammatory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that sounds, yeah. Wow. Um, well, we have a problem. We, 125 immigrants into into Ireland over the past year. Uh, I heard a statistic over the past 24 hours, Steve Bannon pointing out that if you think about the amount of people that landed at the beaches of Normandy to liberate to liberate Europe during World War II on D-Day, 150,000 hmm. people landed on the beaches. Ireland had 125,000 immigrants in the past year. As you mentioned, the health service is being crushed. So Conor McGregor says, yeah, we have an immigration problem and we have a crime problem. Hmm. So let's arrest him for, for speaking that truth. Yeah, I mean, um, I think people should be, should be, I mean, I just like to make clear that uh, because people misinterpret very quickly any intervention in this debate when you're, for example, I am critical of the Irish government's reckless, and incompetent uh, management of, of my immigration. Their immigration policies are destructive and, and basically undermine public services in the country. Um, but for example, this does not mean that I blame the crime problem in Dublin on immigrants. These, these have to be, they're like, they're, they're different issues. Like you have to have good evidence before you start to say that, that, that crime is attributable to uh, immigration. This particular case was a man who'd been in the country for about 10 years and effectively um, did have a deportation order on him. He, you know, he appealed it. So fair enough, he used the law to overcome that and to stay in the country. Um, but 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 there's a, there's a broader issue. The people who were who were, you know, uh, setting public property on fire. I mean, if you listen to the videos, they have thick Dublin accents. They're clearly locals. You know, um, these are just loud oh, opportunists. opportunists who have been al right. allowed to get away with this stuff. Uh, maybe they weren't burning things, but they were, you know, harassing people or uh, assaulting people like the American tourist was a famous case recently of an American tourist, American tourist being assaulted shortly after arriving in Dublin. And um, I think even the American embassy was putting out a warning to tourists, the American government actually, about coming to Ireland, about being careful when they come to Dublin. Um, so, but to get to your issue of, of, you know, the kind of pathetic, uh, use of this, these riots as a way to promote hate speech. I mean, the, 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 the Taoiseach, uh, the prime minister of Ireland actually said almost the day after the riots, I mean, within a, say two days of the riots came out of public and said, uh, these riots uh, show us that we need to modernize, modernize our hate speech legislation. And I was thinking, you know, you would think you might say first, sorry, sorry for allowing the riots to get out of control. Sorry for the failure of our policing and our criminal justice system. You might, you know, let's reform our criminal justice system. Let's get down. Let's really have zero tolerance of, of particularly of a violent crime. Um, but instead of that, right. he just says, oh, we need to control um, hate speech as if more hate speech legislation is going to stop these louts from stealing from people, from, you know, uh, carrying out petty crimes, from drug dealing. It's, it's, it's just a total misdirect. It has nothing to do with the underlying problem. It's just an excuse to promote hate speech legislation, which is, by the way, working its way through 
the uh, Irish Senate as we speak. Um, and um, for, and both you know. both of these things can be true, right? We see Kathy Hochul, the governor of New York, over the past twenty four hours, v, or you know, basically vetoing an, an anti theft or shoplifting bill that would have created a task force to stop petty crime, to stop shoplifting in stores. Four billion dollars in revenue lost by businesses because they're not doing anything to stop it. But the same thing is also true that America has a massive immigration problem and New York City is overrun with illegal immigrants clearing out the Roosevelt Hotel, clearing out these other hotels in order to house illegal immigrants. They've opened these up as sanctuary cities. Both of these things are true. And but the, to go to, to totally misdirect the problem and to go after speech, which is what exactly what Governor Hochul is also doing. I mean, they're all, it seems like they're all operating on the same playbook here. We're going to go after your speech on social media rather than address the real problem. Yeah, I mean, they're taking this as a pretext for expanding their own technocratic power over the population. Because essentially, what is a, free, what is a hate speech regime? It's basically a, a surveillance regime. It's a surveillance regime in which uh, public authorities can, um, in the case of the current legislation going through the Senate, they can get an, a warrant to, uh, you know, enter my property and search my property and seize my uh, my prop, seize my computer, um, and they can force me to give them the password to my my computer. And if I don't cooperate, I can find myself with a jail term of up to two years, um, up to one year, up to one year for not cooperating. I'm sorry, it might be six months, but th the point is that I could be thrown into jail for not giving the password of my computer. Why, what would be the rationale for this if they think they have a reasonable belief that I might have material on my computer that, uh, I'd, that I might eventually publish that could incite violence? So unpublished material, unpublished content, say if I'm on a Word document, I'm writing, I'm writing a, an op-ed on some topic that includes immigration, say, say, and they s somehow found out about the content of my unpublished work, they could get an arrest warrant to come in because they think that some phrase in my article could have incited hatred against a certain ethnicity or against, who knows, uh, immigrants and so on. Um, so... Uh, the point is, it's preemptive. It's not even that it's stuff I've published. It's stuff that I might publish in the future. So it's kind of a thought it's, crime almost. Right. It is very minority report. I know we always reference science fiction. And we th that could never happen. It is happening. You're watching it happen in real time. And you're also seeing it across Europe. And we have journalist friends in, in Germany and other and the UK, of course, that are facing the same sort of backlash from their government right now, sort of thought crime. Uh, is, uh, is is certainly a problem for these governments, not the actual crimes themselves. I wanted to pick up on something, though, that you pointed out, which is this idea of incitement to violence. And I can't believe I'm hearing this, but in, in Ireland, there is a journalistic debate among among journalists, if you want to call, call some of them journalists, on television. You, in fact, tweeted this. I wanted to share a piece of this video where a journalist is having a debate with the so-called another journalist on whether or not he should have published the fact that this person who carried out the stabbing was an immigrant and whether or not he should have kept that information quiet from the public so as not to uh, create more hysteria. And I can't believe this question is even being asked, but I wanted to play this exchange and get you to comment on it. Watch this. Because your oh. website, John McGurk, has received a lot of criticism this for weekend. Reporting the news. For Choosing to highlight clear. the nationality of the suspect in this night attack at a moment in time when there were hostilities in the in the in the uh, city centre, I'm wondering in what way did you feel his nationality had a bearing on this incident? It was entirely relevant because, as subsequent facts have shown, he was somebody who came here, was granted, was was given citizenship after being issued with a deportation order, and has never, according to the Sunday Independent, worked a day in his life. It is relevant because of what happened with Joseph Puska, what happened in Sligo with Yusuf Polanyi. It is further relevant, I would say. I mean, it's fascinating that I'm being asked this question because no one is saying the story was untrue. Essentially, the story. No, I'm not, essentially, I never. I'm not, didn't say it was untrue. I asked you what its relevance yeah, was. It's, it's essentially, the position now seems to have gone from you know, we're worried about misinformation and disinformation to all of a sudden you can no longer report true information or you're whipping up fear. And so I, I would question, your fellow journalist, we're, we're discussing journalism, I would question you, what power do you have, Kira, 
or any journalist have to decide what fact the public should or should not know. I'm not saying You're they have... You, so I'm saying what journalists I'm, I'm do extreme, have I'm John McGurk, but they do have John McGurk, is responsibility. For That's what? what journalists have. Not to overheat and an already Not to overheat situation. or inflame an already hostile situation. That's so the responsibility you're, journalists you're, also what, you're, have. what your essential position is, is that you, as a journalist sitting in that chair, should decide what information the people watching this programme have, and if you decide that they can't handle it, you don't give it to them. In this okay. case, the information was... Okay. So, David, what was your thought when you saw this exchange? Well, um, I, I, I have to admit that there was a part of me that was sympathetic to the to, to the to the idea that there should be restraint sometimes in releasing information that could be inflammatory if the situation is if, if there's a lot of tension in the situation, um, but. Uh, on the other hand, um, I think we're in murky waters when we th when we start to get into the business of withholding information from the public that is relevant to uh, a crime or a public incident. Um, so you're giving a journalist a kind of a, an uncomfortable and strange role when you say to a journalist that they should withhold the nationality of an assailant. For how long? For one hour? For two hours? For six hours? For two days? For a week? Um, I, I, I mean, the other thing that occurred to me was that um, the idea that just naming the nationality of an assailant could provoke chaos and anarchy in a city tells me that the underlying problem is not the journalist releasing that information, but the problem is that public order has gotten out of control in that city and that there's, you know, things are just dysfunctional. So I don't think journalists can be held personally responsible because um, a particular piece of information was then used by some group or, you know, contributed to a tense situation or contributed to violence in some way. Um, otherwise, they'd have to be checking themselves constantly about what they say and what they don't say. So there are just some thoughts that occurred to me the, the last thing to say is that obviously a lot of hypocrisy coming from the Irish media who seem to be so indignant about him releasing this information when that same media right. would have no hesitation in releasing information about, say, conservatives that would, sure. you know, would destroy their reputation <laughs> or, or would even possibly put them in, 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 in harm's way if, it, if, if in some way it's, you know, incited violence against them. So it's a very selective or released yeah or released bad information false information intentionally releasing to call all of these rioters and looters far right wing extremists when they don't know have they interviewed all of these looters do they know yeah so right they're very quick to jump on this we saw this in the United States the Nashville shooter uh, the you know, withholding information about a manifesto that she had written uh, which, of course, would have undermined their narrative. But they were very fast to release the manifesto written by the Buffalo shooter. Uh, and it's it's always apparent what their agenda is and their narrative. Uh, but I think you're right. I think, you know, in the moments of na great national security, you know, national security threat, and if there's a piece of information that could undermine national security, there's been a long history of the United States government working with journalists to make sure that certain things are not released and would protect the uh, the integrity of the United States. But in this situation, I, I completely disagree uh, that withholding the, the nationality of this individual, the riots had already started. Looting had already begun. There was already national outrage about immigration policies in the country. By publishing his nationality was going to incite more violence. I It's not up for these journalists, I think, to decide or to withhold information, in my personal opinion. Yeah, I mean, I think it. I think it. It, it was one of those cases where um, I think a reasonable person could go either way. I think a reasonable person could have said, "Okay, I, I might hold off for a few hours and see how the, the situation develops, but I am going to release it." But but they might have held off a few hours. But I think what I don't agree with is the idea that that we sort of vilify uh, John, the editor of Gript, for releasing that information. Um, you know, for making that judgment call. Uh, and and again, it is a little bit of a misdirect to, to try to pin it on him, what happened, you know? I mean, that's way over right, the top right. to pin it on the journalist who released that information. There's already a lot of anger bubbling over in the city and in Ireland. And that anger is basically attributable to 
um, you know, in the first place to very, very reckless and unfair uh, immigration policies that incentivize people to come to the country, you know, um, and and I, I don't blame the immigrants for that. Obviously, if they're offered a good deal, they're going to come. The problem is not the immigrants. The problem is the public authorities that incentivize high volumes of immigration at a time when services are under-resourced and when housing is way overstretched. It's just common sense that you don't do that. It's just so, it is common sense. So this is a problem waiting to happen in a way, all of this tension um, sooner or later. And, and in a way, this, what sparked it, the immediate spark was this violent attack, assault by this Algerian national who was naturalized Irish citizen upon these children. Right. It turns out when you go and destabilize countries in the Middle East uh, with these reckless Western policies, and then all of these people are displaced and they wind up in your country, it's amazing how that happens. We witness it in the United States, uh, throughout Europe with Syrian refugees. Turns out when they have a really peaceful country and it's and the West decides to meddle in it and invade those countries, uh, bad things tend to happen. And we're witnessing that right now through all throughout Europe. As a matter of fact, uh, David Thunder, we appreciate your thoughtful, nuanced response to this. It's not as cut and dry as the media would have us believe. We appreciate your thoughts from Ireland, and uh, we're going to continue to watch this. I think the world should pay attention to what happens to Ireland with these hate speech laws and broader Europe as well, um, because it seems to be that Ireland is following, uh, following in the footsteps of whatever Brussels uh, really wants to push right now in the EU. Uh, David Thunder, great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching this segment here at Redacted. We are live every day at 4 p.m. Eastern time trying to share the stories that the mainstream media will not cover. You should also come over and join our community of Redacted Rebels over at redacted.inc. That's our private locals community where we can share exclusive content that we simply cannot share here on YouTube. Come over and join the rebellion together right now by going to redacted.inc. We'll see you next time.